Welcome to Front and Center, from political battlefields to cooperative playing fields. Hello, I'm Michael Maxetti. And before I turn it over to my partner, Steve Berriman, to make a proper introduction, I just wanted to say it is only fitting that we are having this conversation today on the first day of American Indian Heritage Month, Monday, November 1st. Steve, please take it away. Well, thank you so much, Mike, and welcome, Glenn. Our guest today is Glenn Aparicio Perry, PhD. He's a writer, educational consultant, international speaker, entrepreneur, with a vision to reform thinking and education into a coherent, cohesive whole. From 1999 to 2011, he organized and participated in the groundbreaking Language of Spirit conferences, bringing together Native and Western scientists and dialogue. He is the founder and past president of the SEED Institute, currently runs a think tank and regularly moderates dialogues. In addition to his current book, Original Politics, Making America Sacred Again, he is the author of the Nautilus Award-winning Original Thinking, A Radical Revisioning of Time, Humanity, and Nature. He also does a podcast circle for uh, a podcast called Circle for Original Thinking. Welcome, Glenn. Uh, very good to be here. Thank you Thank both. Thank you. Sure. Well, you know, as Michael said, you are the third guest in a row speaking to our indigenous heritage, what's been left in and what's been left out. Uh, we had Shauna Blue Star Newcomb, uh, who referred to the Doctrine of Discovery and Domination Code, and her antidote, the Reverence Code. We had Tom Hartman speaking about the lost indigenous culture of Europe, and how that impacted the conquest of the new world and what he refers to as the Wetiko culture, the Native American term for the taker mentality. He ends by saying that we must integrate ancient indigenous knowledge with modern understandings. And so here you are today, uh, Glenn, to speak to us about exactly that, the interweaving of the native and the European to produce the American. Your book, Original Politics, is a deep dive into how these two cultures intermixed over the course of two centuries. So why don't we start there? Tell us about Original Politics and why you wrote the book. Thank you. Uh, why I wrote the book? Um, the way that uh, all projects start, I make a prayer. You know, I, I make a prayer to the ancestors and I ask them, what they want me to do. <laughs> and uh, and uh, sometimes what they ask me to do is rather daunting, but uh, um, if the request is clear, that's what I have to do. So uh, that's really how original politics came about. I had already written the book, Original Thinking, which was more of philosophy of, it's really the philosophies that uh, I have been absorbing my entire life and particularly inspired by, as you mentioned in the bio, the, the Language of Spirit dialogue series that brought together Native elders and Western scientists. And then, you know, so that book was a statement of the philosophy. Now it's more like I think the calling was to put this philosophy into action in the real world. And we tend to think of politics as a real world phenomenon. Um, and of course, people have very differing ideas about politics, but, uh, but no matter what your uh, slant is, your politics is about trying to get something done. It's about some, trying to get something done. Um, and so uh, that's how it came about. Um, and, uh, and then also uh, what really kicked it off for me, and I wrote about this in the preface, was I was taking a, a train trip across America. I had been invited to present at a conference called Honoring Our, the Ancestors of Ancient America, which was a conference of anthropologists and Native Americans. And I'm neither, but I was invited um, by my dear friend, Susan Stanton, who I've done workshops with. She's a Native Hawaiian and Mohawk uh, ancestry. Um, and she invited me. And she also encouraged me to take Amtrak 
to come to her place in uh, uh, Illinois. And I did. I, I, I hadn't taken Amtrak for years. I, I used to live in Woodstock, New York, and there I would take Amtrak into Manhattan all the time. Um, but uh, so I took Amtrak and it's a, it's, a, it's a very slow and leisurely way to go. And uh, uh, I was going by myself. So they would uh, arrange for you to have a meal. You would have to make a reservation for your meal but they would assign you other diners. Sometimes I would be with a, a family of three or something, but on this one occasion, I got assigned to three people who were all traveling separately. Um, and one was a, um, a, a strong Trump supporter who was from Lawrence, Kansas. And the other one was um, a gay African-American poet from Albuquerque. Um, and then there was a Native American and uh, they couldn't be more different in their political views, but I saw that as a great opportunity. And I asked them, you know, what is the sacred? I asked them a dialogue question, which is something I'm familiar with doing. And I asked them, what is the sacred purpose of America? And why do you think your candidate will fulfill that? And the most interesting thing happened because we all had to eat. So, you know, we had a very civil, interesting conversation. And the, uh, the gay African-American poet who was a Bernie Sanders supporter actually considered Bernie Sanders too far to the right. I mean, he couldn't have been, you know, but he started to get along with the Trump supporter so well that it almost freaked me out because they were really getting along very well. Um, and, uh, uh, and then at that point, uh, I came in and, and tried to elucidate some differences, perhaps, and it was just very engaging. It was also heartening because the, the thing is, people can have very differing points of view, but if you, can, if you can listen to each other for the purpose of understanding, which is really the principle of dialogue, rather than just reading your reply as an argumentation or debate, then there's always an opportunity for growth, for learning. And uh, indeed, that's what it was. And the, the Trump supporter, you know, and um, uh, was an intelligent man who just simply thought that the system was so corrupt that he thought Donald Trump was the perfect person to go in there and kind of uh, bust things open. And then uh, uh, and he thought that would bring about a solution. And I don't really t uh, disagree with him in a way that is uh, uh, is, I think, what what tended to happen while Trump was president. But this was in the summer of 2016. So at that time, most pundits predicted that Trump would not be elected president, but in fact, he was. And I'll just stop there. Um, that's, the, that's the origin of the book. And the book really was a, a search for the sacred purpose of America. And how can we achieve that? Well, you know, I'm very curious uh, as to that, you know, what you found out. And, and particularly in the interactivity between the native peoples of this country and the, uh, the settlers, particularly from England. I don't think many people know about that hidden history of how our system actually developed over that almost 200 year period of time uh, between the first settlers and to the American Revolution and our, and our government. Yeah, well, um... Two things. One, something I left out of the book, which uh, a Dutch friend of mine immediately brought to my attention, was the fact that the fact that it wasn't just the British that yeah. uh, the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois were interacting with. In fact, it was the Dutch who were in control of New York and that area north of New York City, uh, which uh, was the Haudenosaunee stronghold. Um, so, of course, uh, Manhattan. Uh, um, it's very much originally a, a Dutch colony, uh, and there's there's some good books about that. But uh, uh, but long before that, you know, I mean, there have been explorers coming to the new uh, uh, to the new world, but they would come and go, and it really was that first colony uh, that the 1620 Plymouth colony that stayed, bringing women and children with them that obviously got the attention of the Indians. And this was uh, uh, something they watched very carefully. And they actually watched from afar. 
uh, uh, they didn't interact uh, uh, right away. The, uh, the Plymouth colony lost a third of their colony or more that first winter. They were starving. They were really struggling. Um, and um, uh, then uh, this one native brave who was known as a Samoset, uh, he strode into the, into the, into the village uh, with one arrow that was headed and one that was unheaded. And he walked very confidently into the village and he was walking right up to the encampment of where the women and children were. And then a bunch of soldiers stopped, stopped him in his path. And they thought that he was being aggressive, but he turned to them and he said, welcome Englishmen. <laughs> welcome Englishmen. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and uh, those are really famous words, and and uh, uh, and he had learned a little bit of English. He had actually learned it from his friend, who was known as uh, Tisquantum, and known to the uh, to the uh, the settlers as Squanto, which we've all learned about in history. Who knew even more English because he had been kidnapped and had spent almost somewhere between seven and a dozen years in Europe um, before he managed to free himself and get back all the way across the pond and he was there and he knew English perfectly um, but the one that they sent as the ambassador was Samoset uh, and uh, uh, that's just the beginning of a partnership that was formed and a 55 years of peace uh, between uh, the Narragansett uh, and uh, the uh, colonial settlers. Um, it doesn't mean that it was peace in all the land, by the way. They actually had an alliance, they had a military alliance, and they, they, they fought the Pequot in 1636 and almost vanquished them. And I mentioned in the book that I think it's a really interesting piece of poetic irony that in the 1990s, the Pequot open at that time essentially the world's largest casino outside about 90 miles outside of new york city at the same time where donald trump's casinos were faltering in atlantic city um and uh, mr trump was not amused and uh, and he he observed he wasn't actually wrong in this observation that the that the pequot but uh, the complexion of the pequot didn't look like the stereotypical indian because in fact they were almost vanquished in 1636 and so uh, the remaining Pequot have taken on a different complexion um, and uh, in any case um, the real point of what you're asking about Steve is that for 150 years uh, the, the European European settlers I would just call them Euro-Americans they were living side by side with Native Americans now I live in New Mexico now, so I'm very blessed that I have ample opportunity to interact with native people. But back then, it was like a hundred times more more uh, likely that you would be encountering native people all around you, you know. And that was, and so that occurred. And often, you know, too often in history, people talk about colonization as if it was a one just a, a one-way event. Um, and the reality is, although a, in the long run, it did turn out that colonization was tremendously destabilizing and tremendously debilitating to Native Americans for a very long time, really up for 200 years, for 150 years leading up to the formation of the Union, and the first 50 years of the United States of America being formed, uh, Native populations were relatively stable, and they were very much interacting with the uh, colonial settlers on a nation-to-nation -nation basis. And they were critically important to the founding of the country in so many ways. Because, you know, whenever you have cultural interchange, 
it's not one way. It's not that the Europeans were all of the enlightenment mentality and they convinced the native people to be that way. Not at all. The native people showed a different kind of way of living to the European settlers. And Ben Franklin famously said, and you'll, you'll have to apologize for the, the choice of his words, but I want to explain that too. But he said, he said that any, any European that has tasted savage life will never go back to our way of living. And that sounds like a completely racial slur, and perhaps it is, but it also is an indication of the word, the way the word savage changed in history. So, uh, you know, um, 200 years ago or 250 years ago, that word really meant only wild and untamed, wild and untamed. And so it wasn't necessarily a, a, a complete racial slur. Um, it was obvious to the Europeans that native people were more comfortable in the wild. They were more, if you look at the very origin of the word wilderness in, in, in European languages, it posits a separation between human and nature and the wild is something to be f afraid of but indigenous people don't really think like that the wild is a place of blessing and wholeness and that's actually at the core of a difference but i guess my point is that uh, some europeans like roger williams who predates ben franklin by 100 years and learns five European languages, he becomes very familiar with native ways of being, very familiar with the wild, um, and, and actually learn, he gains some very valuable insights. Roger Williams is the progenitor of what later becomes the separation of church and state, which he, he really um, offered as a way of protecting native people, his friends, because he didn't want the church to overrun them with their ideology. And he said that, you know, uh, that proselytization of, of religious values was soul rape. That's what Roger Williams said. And so he, he very much protected Native people. He was very beloved by Native people. That's how he was given. When Roger Williams was thrown out of the church, basically, he was given what became known as Rhode Island. It was called first the Bay of Rhode Island then. And he established a colony there that a whole bunch of misfits, let's say, uh, Baptists, Quakers, Jews um, of the time, um, also were welcomed in to this colony. And uh, it, it became an alternative culture um, and probably is to some degree to this day today. So in short, yes, there was a very strong cultural interchange. And it's only natural that in 150 years there was. But everything shifted when Ben Franklin, who had been a treater, a, a printer of uh, Native American treaties between the uh, uh, the British government and uh, and the uh, uh, the native tribes, when Ben Franklin was invited to become the Indian ambassador to uh, uh, the Haudenosaunee, or more commonly known as the Iroquois, and he was asked to be that because it was really critically important that the British government establish a military alliance in the French and Indian Wars. And that's where everything shifted. And I'm going to turn it back over to you, but I'm happy to explain about that in a minute. Yes. Uh, Glenn, one of the things that I really wanted to, to uh, ask you to give us a succinct but deep dive into is the influence of the indigenous tribes on the thinking uh, and formation by our founders and our framers of the government. Few people know because it's been whitewashed out of all of the history books. Uh, they focus on Anglo-Saxon and, and the Bible as, and, the, and the, go back to the Greeks and the Romans, 
but almost, and they totally exclude the impact of the indigenous tribes and the forms of governance that they had learned and that they had used for eons of time. Can you please give us uh, the explanation of as much as you can of the influence of the indigenous tribes onto our founders and framers? Yes, I'd be happy to, and I'll try to do it as succinctly as possible. But, you know, it, and I love your choice of words there, there Michael, um, whitewashed. So I think that was uh, pretty, pretty accurate. Um, so, in fact, uh, you know, almost picking up where I left off, I mean, it's Ben Franklin becomes the Indian ambassador uh, to the Iroquois Confederacy. And because of that, he he forms a friendship with Chief Kana Astego, the Onondaga chief. And that friendship alters the whole path of history because it's 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 the Onondaga chief Kana Astego who addresses the colonists on July 4th. It's interesting it's July 4th, but July 4th, 1744, exactly 32 years before the Declaration of Independence is signed. And he tells the colonists that they should unite like the five fingers of one hand, that they should never fall out with one another, that they should form a strong confederacy as the Iroquois had. And in fact, the Iroquois Confederacy, by some estimates, was as old as 1132 AD. So it had been in force already for more than 500 years before this event happens. And so Chief Conestego urges the colonists to unite. They don't do so right away. But then there's a 1754 Albany Conference that's called that brings us a lot closer and it's in that time that uh, that Ben Franklin and Ben Franklin is really the, the 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 pivotal player in the in the whole formation of the nation. Really, um, Ben Franklin um, proposes that they form a a government that's based similarly to the Iroquois government, um, and the Iroquois government. Was, they didn't have a written constitution in the way that we think of it. Their history was kept on wampum belts, um, but they did they did have a uh, something known as the Great Law of Peace, which which is the way that their government was run, uh, and their government had a lot of similarities to what later became the United States of America. These things are not they're not coincidental. Um, in it, when the United States actually is formed after they form the Continental Congress, uh, Ben Franklin is the principal author of the Articles of Confederation, which are really closely aligned with the Iroquois Great Law of Peace. Ben Franklin proposes a grand council. There's only one legislative body in the Articles of Confederation. It's a grand council. Um, and Ben Franklin proposes 48 members for the Grand Council, where the Iroquois had 50 members. Um, and there's a very there's some very interesting things in the Articles of Confederation that got lost when we when we actually formed the U.S. Constitution. Um, for one thing. All the politicians in the, under the Articles of Confederation worked for free. They all worked for free. They did it out of public service. The same principle still applies in Native America today. As far as I know, all the tribes that I know that, that appoint a governor of the, of the Pueblo or tribe generally is, is a volunteer position for one year. Now, in, in a, a few cases, it's been changed in modern times, like where I live in Albuquerque, Sandia Pueblo, instead of appointing an older man as their as their governor, they once appointed a younger man named Stuart Paisano, who actually served five years and he he actually brought forth their their casino and golf course. Mm -hmm. And and it never would have happened if they had stayed with their normal system of a elder man serving the one ceremonial year. But 
In any case, normally speaking, that's the way it is. An, an elder serves as the in the uh, in that uh, position. And in fact, when the U.S. government started, that's what we did. Now, here's something that'll blow the mind of your listeners, and and they'll probably think I'm crazy, but they, but they, you can look it up. There were presidents before George Washington. Okay, let me explain. So the Articles of Confederation were, they were ratified in 1781. And in 1781, France and Morocco both recognized the United States as a new country. France is really our oldest ally, you know, so they, they immediately recognized the United States as a country. And between 1781 and 1789, the United States was operating under the Articles of Confederation. It's only after the U.S. Constitution is ratified in 1789 that we go under the U.S. Constitution. But the way U.S. history is taught, they teach school children and they teach adults, too, that the Declaration of Independence occurs in 1776. The U.S. Constitution is ratified in 1789 as if nothing happened in between. Well, something did happen in between. <laughs> so the Articles of Confederation was very closely based on, on native ways of governing, completely complete public service by the politicians. They work for free. They all served limited terms, no more than three years. Um, and, uh, and the president, the president, which had that title, served a one year term. And the president, the president of the under the Articles of Confederation, by the way, so you don't think I'm crazy, is rightly distinguished from the presidents that came 1789 afterwards, because they're totally different. So the presidents under the Articles of Confederation had no real power. They, just like a Native American chief, derive their power from the council. So the legislature, the legislature had the power, but they, but the president did do something. John Mason, who was the first president of 1781, the first president after the Articles of Confederation were ratified, he designed the Great Seal of the United States, which has been used by every president since. And, and the Great Seal of the United States, they brought in Ben Frank. Ben Franklin contributed a lot to the Great Seal of the United States um, because, because of what happened with Chief Conostego. So let me backtrack a little bit with the story. Remember I was telling you about Chief Conostego saying to the colonists that they should unite like we did. You should be a strong Confederacy like we were, we are. Well. Chief Conestego handed Ben Franklin a single arrow in 1744 in front of all the, all the, all the colonies, uh, the representatives of the colonies. And before Ben Franklin could do anything with that arrow, he took it back and he broke it over his knee. And then he reached behind him and got a sheaf of arrows. I don't know if it was 13 arrows, but it was a sheaf of arrows. And he did the same thing. He went to break it over his knee, but it did not break. And the meaning was plain to all. It was clearly that there was strength in numbers, strength in numbers. And so uh, Ben Franklin never forgot this. And when it came time to design the Great Seal of the United States, he proposed that in the left talon of the eagle, the eagle would hold a sheaf of 13 arrows. And that's, of course, the way it is to this day. And Ben Franklin, by the time of the Constitutional Convention, he was an old man. He was enfeebled with gout and kidney stones. And so he didn't really have that huge role in the U.S. Constitutional Convention. He was, he was respected and revered. But it was the upstarts, the Alexander Hamilton, who was 28 at the time of the U.S. Constitutional Convention, and Madison was 32. They were the ones who pushed for the Constitutional Convention. They were the ones who wanted to radically reform the office of the presidency to give the president more power. But you sh everyone should realize, though, that as much power as the first presidents got, they they 
gained power over time because the founding fathers tried to limit the power of the U.S. president. Um, and uh, in fact, they gave to the U.S. Congress the, the right, the sole right to declare war. But the U.S. Congress has abdic abdicated that responsibility and they haven't declared war since 1942, even though we've, we went on to get in the Korean War and the Vietnam War. These were wars, but the, U the U.S. Congress never declared war. So they were officially called conflicts or something. <laughs> so, yeah. I hope that helps. <laughs> it does. Thank you. Uh, before we go on, I'd like to also uh, your book, Original Politics, which I think is a, is a, a an important and, and good read for for anyone. Uh, let me, if you will, read from a, a summary, if you will, a brief. Original Politics: Making America Sacred Again. To recreate a whole and sacred America. It is important to piece together the forgotten fragments of history that are currently keeping the country divided. Just as a traditional Native American potter begins a new pot with shards of old pots to honor the ancestors and bring the energies of the past into the present, original politics reassembles the nation as a whole out of the seemingly disparate shards from our origins. The most significant forgotten piece is the profound effect Native America had on the founding values of this nation. Mm, thank you. You know, um, the reason why I, I wrote that synopsis of the book is because I was profoundly influenced by uh, some potters, Dolores, Luis Garcia, and Emma Lewis Mitchell, who are the daughters of the great Potter from Acoma, uh, Lucy Lewis. They're the ones that taught me that, you know, whenever they make a new pot, they begin with the shards of an old pot. So really what they're doing is they're bringing the, they're bringing together the old and the new in a timeless creation of original beauty. And that's really what, uh, the nation of the United States needs to do now, because our original roots, our sacred, our sacred purpose, as I see it anyway, inspired by Native America was unity in diversity, unity in diversity, the acceptance of different points of views, the acceptance of the integrity of the difference. Sometimes I like to use an example of sacred mayonnaise if you will you know mayonnaise mayonnaise is an emulsion it's an emulsion so everybody knows that oil and water can't mix we say but in fact in in certain emulsions oil and water are held in a balance so that the integrity the difference is respected the same thing has to apply for uh, women and men for Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives, Native Americans and Euro-Americans, um, and all the other Americans that have come to inhabit this land as we embraced our sacred purpose of unity and diversity increasingly over time. So, so uh, um, that's the, our sacred purpose, but we've been, we actually have been successful mostly in achieving that sacred purpose, but we had a long way to come to go. I will give the founding fathers a lot of credit for the phrase and the preamble of the United States Constitution, which speaks of, uh, of moving toward a more perfect union. It's not a coincidence that Barack Obama, that was his favorite phrase. He would repeat it constantly because i'm sure obama was obviously aware that in the founding of the nation it was a nation founded on slavery even enshrined in the u.s constitution and here was an african-american man serving as the u.s president so of course he highlighted the phrase moving toward a more perfect union um and for good reason um because when we founded the nation 
the founding fathers, they didn't directly, they gave the power to the states to set the voting laws, really. And then what happened was the states, with some exception, all voted in a way so that the 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 power uh, defaulted to white male property owners. There were some weird exceptions, by the way, including New Jersey. It's funny, like in Hamilton, they talk about anything could happen in New Jersey. Well, in New Jersey until 1807, um, anybody who was a property owner, be they uh, male, be they female, or be they a person of color, could vote and could vote. Um, and in the colonies, by the way, before the United States government was formed, uh, people of color or women could vote if they were property owners. But anyway, basically, for the most part, only white male property owners could vote when the nation was founded. Andrew Jackson comes in in the 18 in 1828 and he gave the the vote. It was actually considered progressive. He gave the vote to white males who didn't have property. That was actually progress. Um, and then uh, uh, you have to wait till the Civil War before uh, African Americans uh, get the right to vote and till 1924 before Native Americans uh, get the right to vote. Um, and, uh, and, and women only get the right to vote nationally in 1920. But there are some weird exceptions like Wyoming gave the right to vote to women in 1870. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's not a cut and dried thing, but in general, there's an arc. And I agree with what Theodore Parker said and Barack Obama and Martin Luther King like to quote that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. So I think that has been happening in the United States, but there are definitely times where there are severe backlashes. The 1850s was one of them where um, we had a third party, the, the American party, which was better known as the Know Nothing Party, which was a, a party that, that sought to exclude uh, Quakers, Jews, and, and those that had recently immigrated. They were an anti-immigration party. They actually placed 100 people in Congress, 100 people, never a president, 100 people, but they did have a relatively short run and they fell apart because of a quirk of fate, really, the Whig Party. The Whig Party had a had internal debate over what to do about slavery and it divided into two factions and one was pro advancement of slavery into new states and one was uh, against advancement of slavery in the new states which Abraham Lincoln, who was a Whig, ends up in the party that is against advancement of slavery in the new states, and that becomes the Republican Party of Lincoln. And the Republican Party is formed in 1856, exactly 16 years after the official formation of the Democratic Party, even though we think of the Democratic Party as going back to Andrew Jackson. It was the Democratic Republican Party then. It was actually both. It was called the Democratic Republican Party. Then they finally dropped the Republican in 1840. So that became our, our modern Democratic Party. And the weirdest thing, guys, is that the Republican Party and the Democratic Party were formed for the exact same reason they stated. They were formed to offer an alternative to the other party, which they identified as the party of aristocracy. Very interesting. And, and, you know, that that brings us to where we are today. Uh, one of the things that you've written about is the differences between the Western culture and the Native cultures. And uh, this may be a time to bring those together in reunion of some kind. What are those profound differences and how might they be woven together? Well, I, I thank you for that question. That's a really appropriate question. I listened to some of the uh, foundational interviews you done already. One with Charles Eisenstein was terrific. Um, I I listened to the young woman. I'm blanking out her name now. The Shauna, 
uh, speaking about the reverence code and moving away from the uh, doctrine of discovery, um, Charles, of course, is talking about moving away from the story of separation to embracing a, a new story and trying to move away and, you know, from dehumanizing the other side. Um, and I think that's, that's very, very important um, uh, truths that they're getting at. And we're, uh, I'm more familiar with Charles' work um, um, from, and, and uh, what he's speaking about, the story of separation, in a different way, I've been speaking about the same thing. So I tend to focus on uh, what happened a little over 600 years ago um, in the European Renaissance when uh, uh, the invention, or perhaps it was the reinvention of linear perspective in art. <laughs> and what that did was um, that actually created a worldview. It's really a worldview because we begin to see the world through that lens. It's not just something in an art painting. <laughs> so, you know, linear perspective became the way we saw the world so that we we would speak about you know things that would happen to us in the near future or things that would happen to us in the distant future see we're looking out on a landscape and things that are near to us we 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 think of in time this is how we shifted the way we looked at time because before then we looked at time, the ancient Greeks looked at time as unfolding in the energy of a circle, Aristotle, Plato, they all looked at it as a circle. All cultures looked at time as a circle. And the way we looked, the way we created time, I mean, it came from astrolabes and sundials and then, you know, and then watches that all moved in a circle the way the sun moved. It's, but but when we invent linear perspective and we start thinking about the future as ahead of us, which actually the ancient Greeks thought the opposite, they thought the future was behind them, where they didn't have eyes to see, and the past was ahead of them where it had already manifested. But I know that freaks people out sometimes, but that's the way the ancient Greeks thought. So as soon as we think everything's ahead of us, then we try to predict and control it. And that's the core of what Charles Eisenstein has been talking about for so long of the story of separation. We have embraced this story so much that we see everything as separate. And, and I couldn't agree more with, with Charles or with indigenous peoples who have long understood that we are actually created of the elements. We are the light we are the air we are the water we are the earth da vinci understood this and he was quoting the ancestor the ancients when he talked about this you know that you know that um we are the microcosm of the macrocosm all the ancients who spoke about this and the including indigenous peoples who tend to speak about it more today understand that we are the earth and, you know, I often think of it like this. We're so much closer to a plant than we realize. I, I object to the phrase, you know, somebody's a vegetable, you know. <laughs> what are you talking about? Plants have living consciousness. And they also, they emerge. Everything that is born is born in the dark and grows toward the light. Everything. We're, humans are born inside our mother's womb. But we grow up when we are born, we grow toward the light. Corn is considered very sacred by native people because it's really a grass and it grows like a two legged. It grows up. So that's one of the reasons it's sacred. In fact, uh, Sean Secatero, who's the uh, youngest son of grandfather Leon Secatero, did a whole doctoral dissertation on corn and native education right down to the where you get the corn pollen and the tassel, you get the tassel, like you graduate, you know, when you get the, when you get up there, you know, there's such a similarity between corn and, and humans, it's, it's pretty amazing. That's why in native stories, corn and humans co-evolved 
so in short, um, a native worldview and a native way of operating politics would include the natural world because it's obvious to indigenous mind, it, it seems to me, you know, that we are radically interconnected with all there is. And that's the that's the, the root reason why the Lakota speak of Mitaku Mitaku Ye Oyasin. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Mitakue Oyasin, we are all related, all our relations, all prayers can end with that, because we are all related, you know, uh, and I'm not of Native American blood myself. My mother, though, is of uh, my my mother, grandmother on my father's side is Basque and it's so they're European indigenous. I was blessed to grow up with my grandmother in my family home. So it, it just felt like coming home to me to hear a native world view that understood that everything was radically interrelated. And when it came to politics, it was a way of planning that included the natural world. And that is, it seems to me, critically important if we're going to survive in the West, we have to recover that because we understood that in Western culture once. Thank you, Glenn, for that. Uh, I'd like to focus now, if you will, on how we can move forward from, from your learnings. I know you have started and are heavily involved in what you created here, the Circle for Original Thinking. So the Circle for Original Thinking, as you stated it, is the mission of Circle for Original Thinking is to seek out the deep origins of contemporary thought in order to remember and restore heart-centered wisdom for humanity and all our relations on earth. And the vision of Circle for Original Thinking is to restore thinking to its origins and full spectrum in keeping with the way nature thinks. The purpose is to shift and shape thinking towards wisdom and wholeness and to bring this heart-centered wisdom into contemporary society. Would you elaborate mm. on that? Thank you for that. And, you know, it's a pretty radical statement to speak about how nature thinks, because most, uh, mostly in the Western world, we would never imagine nature thinking, but uh, that, that's the way I <laughs> tend to conceive of things. Um, and and uh, certainly indigenous people uh, uh, act that way. Well, we do a dialogue circle when a, uh, at Seed, um, Leroy Little Bear was the moderator. Um, and we would have an opening to the east. And the reason we had an opening to the east, and it could have been to the west, north, south, but in his tradition, it's to the east. Um, the reason I have an opening is because it was believed that we're, as dialogue participants, we're trying to be a conduit to nature flowing through the room. Thought itself is alive, thought is moving. Where does thought originate from? I mean, that's a lot to do with the first book I wrote, Original Thinking. It originates in nature. You know, that's its source. That's why, you know, the new field today of eco-psychology is really onto something really important. And some of my favorite people in the world, Dave Abram, um, one of them, you know, is an eco-psychologist, really, because he's tracing the origin of thought to nature. He's understanding that all of nature speaks, all of nature speaks, all of nature is alive. Um, other people I really have great respect for like Sagesh Youngblood Henderson, who's head of the Native Law Center in Saskatoon and involved with the Terra Lingua organization, which is tracing the origin, the connection between language, thought, culture, all of it's interconnected. It's all radically interconnected. But somehow in the West, we've come away with a different idea. And we've thought that we, we, propose, we presume that thoughts are inside my head, thoughts inside Steve's head, thoughts inside Michael's head. And that we're, and, and it's a freak, it's very unusual if we're able to read somebody else's mind. But it's not really like that. It's a, thought is alive and moving between us. It's a field we create, like Rumi speaks about. It's a field of interaction, you know. And that's where we're that's where we're dancing there, you know. So um, 
That is so important that that we realize this in the political realm, um, because as long as we don't realize it, we're going to keep keep enhancing polarization. We're going to keep thinking and dehumanizing and demonizing the other side that thinks a little bit differently when the reality is, is quite different. It's that we're all aspects of the whole. We're all contributing to the whole. And, and a conservative view is really necessary for a liberal view, uh, uh, just as necessary as a liberal view, because there's two energies in nature, you know, one to progress, and want to conserve. <laughs> you need them both. You need them both to be uh, have a holistic view, and they need to be in, in relative balance so that they're so that each one keeps the other one in check. And I wrote about this a lot in Original Politics, including writing about Thomas Paine and Edmund Burke and the way that they played off each other. They each complete the other, you know, and that's the way that it ought to be. That's the way it ought to be, and. And uh, I'm worried about our nation now, frankly, because um, it's very out of balance. It's very out of balance. And and uh, we're at a point where our very republic is threatened. Um, but that's another story. Maybe that's too far off where you want to go. <laughs> I turn it back to you guys. Steve? Well, I think that, that, that that's exactly what the, what the condition is right now. So if we were to, if we were to wrap this, uh, if we were to wrap this around one thing, looking at the current condition that we're in, this, uh, this separation where obviously sides are not listening to one another, um, if nature had a voice, what would nature say? What would nature speak into our current condition? Hmm. By the way, I enjoyed the chimes. The nature has been chiming in throughout this interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you're making me feel like you know, uh, your your question is almost reminiscent of you know the Zen monk that <laughs> is ready to give a speech and he opens his mouth and then a a bird sings and then you know that's the whole speech. He doesn't have to say anything else. You know, it's. I mean, how does <laughs> how does a single human talk about what nature wants to happen? I mean, I think that as much as is possible for myself, I I do try to try to align myself with what is unfolding, what's already unfolding. Nature knows where it's going. It's kind of up to us to try to feel into that, and then it's just like the Taoist speak about then we're we're you know I mean it's it's almost too tritely spoken about go with the flow but there is a flow there is an unfolding something's unfolding if we are going with that it's obviously going to happen more easily if we're going against it it's going to it's we're going to meet resistance and too often human beings try heroically to do things that are just human and really the power is in nature and if we can align ourselves with that power the way it's unfolding we'll do better and we have to do that in the political realm and that's really more of a conservative viewpoint honestly you know because that's the way edmund burke would have thought about it you know that nature has an unfolding capacity the uh, liberal point of view is more the uh, progressive push progress push progress but that is also part of nature. Nature has growth. Nature has growth. Nature has progress. But it also it, it goes in a circle, that progress. So it's, you know, the, a seed is planted in the ground. Uh, the, the roots go down. So you go from seed to root to bud to fruit. And that's why my favorite quote in the whole universe came from Ralph Waldo Emerson, who said that all our progress is an unfolding, like the vegetable plant, you first have an instinct, then an opinion, then a knowledge, as the plant has root, bud and fruit, trust your instinct to the end, though you can render no reason, it is vain to hurry it, by trusting it to the end, it shall ripen into truth, and you shall know why you believe. So 
the reason why Emerson's quote is so brilliant is that is, you know, at least the way I interpret it, this is the way to coordinate your, really your gut feelings with your heart and with your head. It's two people try to, to, to prematurely use their head. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. we do need to use our head, but we also need to use our gut and our heart, you know, because all of it is interconnected. And, uh, uh, and in fact, I, I do believe the romantics were correct to try to counterbalance the uh, enlightenment that was moving too quickly toward the, the rational view as everything. And uh, uh, modern conservatives that understand that the heart is important, that's really an important voice. Um, the rational mind is very important, but it has to come after there's engagement with the world from a gut level, immersion in the world to a heart level. Then your head comes in and it makes sense because, you know, if you let the, if you let the, uh, the rational mind run free, too freely you have things like the creation of atomic bombs which it's only like after it happened that some you know that uh, uh oppenheimer you know realizes oh my god what have i created you know i've become the destroyer of worlds you know einstein and others um are really deeply uh saddened over over what they've unleashed um, and it's uh, uh, it's super important to have wisdom leading. And you know, native tribes, I don't want to make a too big a generalization, but a lot of Native American tribes had a balance between wisdom and action that often had the women's council were the wisdom council and the men's council were the, were the uh were the 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 ones that enacted action in the world well that to me seems like is a really good balance you know it's a really good balance because uh you need wisdom to come first and then you need action in the world and let's face it i mean we we're never going to have in the u.s congress a division like like native tribes have between women's council and men's council, but we but women and men do interact a little bit differently. And men are really good at getting stuff done in the world, really good, you know. But we need direction. <laughs> so the and the women can be really good because women traditionally, and not traditionally, biologically are more aligned with the unfolding nature, you know. Uh, and when we gave credence to that before the Gregorian calendar, we ran on a lunar calendar, you know, because we understood that that women were in tune with the unfolding of the month and and hence the year, you know, and uh, I think that's a good way to go. Frankly, we really need to um, see the wisdom of women and then and men need to be able to operate from that wise perspective then let the men get stuff done because we're really good at that but only when it's, it'll work best when we're working from wisdom first you know here we are uh, supposedly in the age of aquarius and uh the sign for aquarius is a man with a uh with a vase full of water and that water is feminine wisdom so the idea of where we're supposed to be right now, if astrology is, has anything to say about it, is that we have that, uh, the men actually recognizing the value of, uh, of feminine wisdom. Uh, oh. And that's what Aquarius is all about. This is the dawning of <laughs> the age of Aquarius. Thank you for that. And maybe okay. that will lead us to the dawning of the age of reunion. Yeah. And that's where uh, we need to go and transition from the age of separation to the age of reunion. And Glenn, um, I couldn't thank you enough for the work that you've done, the books that you've written, uh, and your continued work, the Circle for Original Thinking, um, 
to help us move forward together and reconnect all of the wisdom of the indigenous world with the modern thinking so that we can move forward together. Steve, anything you would like to wrap with in the, before I- Oh, I, I, think, I think this is, uh, thank you so much, Glenn, for all of that perspective, uh, that the value of the feminine wisdom, the value of nature, particularly at a time when the dominant paradigm seems to be uh, very mental, uh, based on the religion of science. And that intuitive aspect is the, seems to be the missing wisdom as we watch the Sorcerer's Apprentice, uh, a la the Mickey Mouse cartoon is, that we're all familiar with from Fantasia, um, not knowing what he doesn't know and, uh, and so on. So we have to bring in that deep knowledge. And I really, really appreciate your perspective, uh, historical and uh, looking toward uh, a more, the more beautiful future. So thank you. Beautiful future that our hearts know is possible. I think that's yeah, awesome. exactly. And it's just uh, it's very possible. And what you're speaking about really gets to the core of it. It has a lot to do with reuniting feminine wisdom with masculine wisdom, um, and uh, recognizing that that holistic uh, approach is what we need to bring. Yeah. Thank you again, Glenn. And to our audience, we hope you found this conversation enlightening and invite you to follow Front and Center. If you can, please support our work by subscribing so that Steve and I can continue to pay our rent and continue with this work. From political battlefields to cooperative playing fields, it's a long journey. Let us go there together. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>